words you're about to hear, I am very confident of because we're going to read them straight out of Scripture. That's the best place to go if you want to hear the word of the Lord, isn't it? If you'd stand with me and turn to the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, we are going to look at another situation here where we see Jesus, and that's what we've been doing over the last uh, five or six Sundays, just little vignettes of what Jesus did, and here's one of the most amazing ones of all. Let's read it together. It's John 13. I'll read it out loud, and you can follow along. I'm in the NIV. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Oh, then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you. Should I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. The title of the sermon this morning is The Humility of Love. Too often the world defines loving someone or something because it fills a need in their life, in their heart. And so it's really about what it gives to them. That's not the God love. It's a, the, the world's idea of love really is a transient love. It's a fickle love based on moods and circumstances, feelings. And it really isn't love at all. Jesus showed us a love that comes from humility, a heart to sacrificially serve the one we love. Helping others has and this is a quote from Max Lucado, helping others has a certain charm as long as it doesn't inconvenience or cost us too much. But genuine servanthood is about being put upon. Unquote. Serving, loving with the heart of a servant isn't always convenient or easy. And the love of God isn't a mood, it's not fickle, it doesn't here today and gone tomorrow. The love of God loves, loves faithfully. You can trust it. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. Before we talk about this passage of Scripture, I thought it would be good to go and look at the opposite of what this humility that the Lord showed, this love that, that, God, that Jesus showed, and, and see what the opposite is so we can better understand what the humility of love is. And the opposite is the arrogance of pride. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, he called pride the great sin. And I'll quote him. They're on the, on the screen. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. He goes on to say, pride is essentially competitive. Listen closely as I, as, I, as I quote him. 
Let this, let, this, let this get into you. Understand this. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. If everyone became equally rich or clever or good looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud. The pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition is gone, pride has gone. Think about it. A friendly game of basketball, if it's not done in the right spirit, and I like a competitive game, I like to compete in a board game, a basket, any, any, you know, it's no fun if you're not trying to win, right? But if I lose, which is usually the case, it's okay, right? And that's why some of us are amazed when you go to the church league and you're having a friendly basketball game between two churches and a fight breaks out. What does that tell you? As I was preparing this sermon, the Lord brought a remembrance back to me from my childhood. And you get to hear it. <laughs> he must have given it back to me for one, some reason. I was in Kenya. My parents were missionaries there for a, a time. I was in fourth grade. As a missionary on the field, you live quite well in comparison to the people around you if you're in a third world nation. Did you hear me? We had a car. They didn't have cars. Very few of them had cars. I had a bicycle to ride. Most of the African boys did not have bicycles to ride. We hired Africans to mow our yard, clean our house, do our laundry, and cook our meals. We could afford to hire them to do it. I'm in fourth grade. What do I know? What does a fourth grader know? But I knew that I was better than the people around me. Then, we took a trip to Nairobi, because we lived out in the, in the bush. Oh, and by the way, we had a house made of brick with a tin roof. The Africans had houses made out of mud with grass roofs and dirt floors. I could go on if you want to talk about comparison. Then we took a trip to my Nairobi, and we went to one of the... Ho Nairobi's a very big city. And there's wealthy people that live in Nairobi. And we went to the, a hotel. And I remember, isn't this, this is just the devil in people. I remember in that lobby of that hotel being embarrassed and ashamed that the people there at the hotel had obviously way more money than we did. Trust me, you don't go to Nairobi from Europe or the United States to go on safari or vacation unless you're fairly wealthy. Now, why did I tell that story? Because first of all, I'd like to say that in our hearts, in our fallen nature, we are prideful people. It's pride. I could be proud up in Mahila, in Nairobi, I remember sitting there, I, sitting, standing, I can't remember, but I remember thinking, I one day want to be like the people that are in this lobby and not like my mom and dad. Think about that. And I think the reason that memory came back to me is because it, this whole idea of comparison, pride is, well, at least I'm better than fill in the blank. You know? Pride. 
The truth of the matter is, is that pride is a tormenting burden in our, our life. And I picked that picture because I want you to think of that burden on that man's back as he goes up that hillside as being pride. Spiritually blind people do not realize. Why? Because they're blind. That the thing they cling to so tightly is the very thing that is destroying them. It is like carrying an unnecessary heavy burden through life that makes it impossible to truly enjoy the life God has given. You know, we sang the song, I'll trade sunshine for rain, I'll trade comfort for pain. And there's times in our life when for us, we need to do that. We need to give, and, and sometimes that's... But the truth, as if you, the bottom line is, you're really going to be trading rain for sunshine when you follow the Lord. You see what I'm saying? I'm not saying it's all sunshine. I'm just saying, if you want to look at the sum totality of your life, you get that thing off your back, you're going to live a better life. That thing called Pride. You will enjoy life the way God wants you to. That's why Jesus did what he did in that upper room. Right before he was crucified. Obadiah, verse 3 says, you have been deceived by your own pride. That thing you cling to so tightly. Think about it. Pride is where evil actually began. Isaiah 14 teaches us that Lucifer, in his pride, rebelled against his creator God. He wanted power and glory that only belonged to God. He wasn't happy as an assistant to God, but instead wanted to have God's job. I want to be like God. The result was that Lucifer was cast out of heaven and has only eternal damnation ahead of him and no hope. He was deceived by his own pride. Then he comes after Adam and Eve. And you remember what he used to get them? It was pride, wasn't it? Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. That is pride. You see, pride puts us into the position of opposing God. You want to be a proud man or woman and walk around with your chest out and your nose up? Let me tell you what, you're in opposition to God. And a life opposed to God does not go well or end well. I'm going to do it my way. Uh huh. How's that working for you? Proverbs 8.13 says, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. God hates it. He hates pride. He hates arrogance. And guess what, my friends? Religious people are not immune. In fact, sometimes we're some of the most guilty of our pride and our self-righteousness. And so we must all be on guard against it. Our fallen nature is weighed down with pride, and as a result, we suffer the undesirable consequences it brings. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes... Now, look at this with me, please. When pride comes, what follows? Then comes disgrace. Maybe not today, and maybe not tomorrow, but it's coming. But with humility comes wisdom. When Jesus washed those apostles' feet, was that pride or was that humility? What example was he setting for us? Think about it. Pride is the deadly disease from which we need to be cured. Have you ever been sick and you don't know why and you're trying to get, and it's like, oh, I hope the doctor can figure this out. What is it I need to, to get well? Well, from a spiritual perspective, what you need is to get rid of your pride. Why? Because it eats up our peace and contentment and it removes the possibility of love. Why? Because it creates enmity between us. Why? Because it's competitive. How can I love you when I'm constantly competing with you? 
I need to be better than you. I can't be a preacher that goes to a preacher's meeting and go, oh, I wish my church was like their church. Or, uh, no, I'm proud to be right where God wants me, and that's a good kind of pride. And I'm happy and proud of preachers that, that, that are having active churches that are growing. Fantastic! Right? I'm not competing. By the way, some pastors do. Just thought I'd tell you that. We need to work together. No. It, it, it creates enmity between us. It, 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 enmity is like hatred. It, it's, we're not really working together. We're working against each other when we're full of pride. And it causes us to do some very stupid things. Pride will get you and you will go, why did I do that? I have a long list of things because it comes in hundreds of forms. You can't possibly, I could stand up here all day long and talk about stupid things that pride will do. I don't have time to do it. I'm tempted to leave out saying anything, but I, I, I think I'll, I'll just say one. How about this one? Borrowing four mo far more than I should to buy something that will impress people I don't even know. Really? And about five months into those payments, and you're going, why did I do that? Pride. Pride. Well, another stupid thing that I will talk about in, that, that applies here is what the disciples were doing. In Luke 22, 24, now notice I'm not in John, I am in, I am in Luke. So this isn't in the passage in John, but it happened, it's just that John didn't record it. So after Jesus has done what we call the Last Supper, we, where he's, they've had the bread and the wine, and he said, you know, this is my body that is broken for you, and this, this wine represents my blood that is given for you. Do you know what they did? Verse 24 of Luke 22, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. At the Last Supper, their Lord is about to be betrayed, and they know it because he's told them. He's told them he's about to give his life. And they're, they're thinking, oh, the kingdom is coming, and oh, I wonder which of us will be greatest in that kingdom, and I think I'll be greater than you. No, you won't. Well, why do you think you'll be greater than me? Can you imagine the Lord listening to this? After he's, and his heart's breaking, isn't it? We know that from when he goes to the garden just a few hours later. And that's what they're doing. They'd spent three years with Jesus. They'd heard the Sermon on the Mount and many other teachings about humility. They had watched the humility of Jesus as he ministered to people and to them. And still, they disputed. Pride. But let us be careful before we throw stones or try to remove the speck from their eye. And remember that eventually nearly all of these men will be martyred for Christ one day. When they get filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, things changed. The Holy Spirit takes that pride and he says, uh-uh. Men changed. Women changed. Brother and sister, it's no different to you and me this very morning. Do you want to change? Understand what the humility of love is and turn your back on the arrogance of pride. Pastor, I'm not proud. Maybe I will give one example because I want you to see the forms, that, what the forms that pride can take. Listen to this. I have an, let's say that I'm just making this up. This is just an illustration. You have an opportunity for an advancement in your, in your work. You get something that will pay better. It's an advancement. But you don't take it. You don't want it. 
because you're afraid you'll fail at it. Well, pastor, that's not pride. That's, that's the opposite. No. It can have its motivation in pride. As long as I stay doing this same old thing I've done for a million years, I'm the best at it. People come and ask me questions about it. And I, they, they come to me because I know my way around here. But if I go do that, I'm no longer the, the big fish in the little pond. I'm the little fish in the big pond. And what will people say if I fail? Do you see where pride can even come into that situation? Did you know that people can serve out of pride? Well, look at, look at what we're doing for you or for them. See, pride is it, it's very deceptive, brother and sister. And we need to be on our guard against it. Now let's go back to, what, to the, the section in John 13. Verse 1 said, It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now here we see that he, he says, My hour has come. Do you remember what he told his mother when she wanted him to deal with the wine shortage at the wedding in Cana? He said, My hour hasn't come. Woman, why are you bothering me with this? My hour hasn't come. And throughout the, the Gospel of John, there's things that happen where he says, no, my hour hasn't come. Now we get to the 13th chapter of John, and guess what he's, he's saying? My hour has come. This is it. And he knew it. And then it goes on to say he loved them to the end. Does that mean till the end of his life? What does that mean? Well, when you look at the Greek, based on what I read, it really doesn't mean that. It means he loved them completely with nothing held back. Nothing. Now, what does he know? He knows one's going to deny him three times. He knows one's going to go sell him out for 30 pieces of silver and betray him. And he knows all of them are going to desert him. But he loved them to the end. Anyway. Did you know that Jesus even washed Judas' feet knowing what was about to happen? Think about that. Verse 3 says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under His power, all things, and that He had come from God and was returning to God. I want us to consider the level of authority and power Jesus had. This is not only the King of kings, but the Lord of all the universe. All things under His power. If there was anyone who could puff out their chest and stick their nose in the air and look like somebody, it could have been Christ, wouldn't you think? The creator of heaven and earth, there he is. Listen, that's what makes this a miracle. All power. He wasn't grasping for, oh, you guys, this is, I'm so, no. He takes off his, armor, his outer garments, wraps a towel around his waist, and washes their feet one at a time. Wow. We, we've seen him calm the waves and settle the storm so he's the Lord of nature. We've seen him raise dead people. We've seen him create eyes in a man born blind. We've seen him change water to wine, which, by the way, is impossible chemically to do. None of these things could be done unless God did them. He had the power, all power. He had the power to choose to save the world or to save himself. And he chose to become a servant. Verse 4. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. 
So the one with matchless power and authority stooped to wash feet. Now you might think, what's the big deal washing somebody's feet? Actually, I come from a tradition in the Church of God. We would have foot washing services around Easter time. Nazarenes, don't, we don't do that. But as a child, I remember doing that. The men would go in one room and the women in another, and we'd have basins and we'd wash each other's feet as a, a symbol. Almighty God, with all the power, stoops to wash feet. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. Washing feet, which is a common thing in that culture, was done only by the lowliest of slaves. One of the commentaries that I read said that Jewish slaves wouldn't even do it. That it would be a foreign slave, somebody from some foreign land. It was the lowest. If you were the foot washer, you, were the, you not only were a slave, but you were the lowest slave. You do know in, in communities of slaves, there's a pecking order, right? Well, you're at the bottom of that order. You're the bottom of the bottom if you're washing feet. Washing the dirt off of people's feet was the most demeaning job there was. And by the way, their feet were dirty. Why? Because they wore sandals and they walked on dirt and muddy roads. And then when they went to sit down or recline to eat, here's this nasty, dirty feet. Coming to, the, coming to eat with dirty feet? Go wash your feet. Do you remember the story we looked at? where Jesus told Simon, the Pharisee, he said, she washed my feet with her tears. You didn't wash my feet when I came in. You remember that? And I think it's important that we notice this. They had dirty feet. No one had washed them. Why? Because no one would stoop to do it. You'd think one of the lower apostles would do it. Hey, Bartholomew, the ones we don't know much about. Are you going to do the, who's going to, for heaven's sake, wash your own stinking feet. (laughs) Why does somebody have to wash them? They hadn't washed them. And it's not like, and they've already, they're already eating. It's not like it's, this happens after they've started to eat. And the Lord, I know, when he he heard them arguing about who was going to be the greatest, he just got up from the meal and 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 he took off his outer garment, wrapped that towel around his waist, and, and washed their feet. They were too proud to do it, but he would do it. And even though Jesus had taught them many times about being a servant and that the last shall be first, they don't they don't get it yet. There could be no greater difference between the task and Jesus who performed it. Verse 6. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. You know, I think Peter's consternation is understandable. He got it. The God of all heaven and earth is about to wash my feet. The Messiah, the Son of God. No! There's something, there's something admirable about that. But what's not admirable about it is he's telling God what to do and what not to do. But he's confused. It doesn't make sense. Why would you be the one washing the feet? No! But he... Jesus says, well, if you don't let me wash your feet, you can have nothing to do with me. Then he says, well, then give me a bath. (laughs) Jesus says, no, no, you're already clean. It's just your feet that needs to be washed. (laughs) Peter, something else, isn't he? You have to love him. Let's skip to verse 12. When he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. 
You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. He said to, him, he said to them, do you understand what I've done for you? Do we? This morning, you, do you understand? Do I understand? I doubt we do. I really do. I know I don't. I get a glimpse of it. I got a piece of it that God, through Christ, would wash men's feet. Okay, but I'm, it's hard to... What? Whew, it's bigger than our brains to think of them. The God who created the heavens and the earth stoops to wash dirty feet. I don't... I, Lord, help me to even get a piece of what that really means. Do I understand it? How can we possibly understand this kind of love, this complete love that will stoop to wash feet? And then he says, I've set an example. What is the the example that he set? What did he do that we're supposed to... You know, an example is something you're supposed to follow, right? Right? What is that example? Well, I'll tell you this. It's the exact opposite of pride. That arrogance of pride. This remarkable scene dramatizes the self-emptying that brought Jesus from heaven all the way to where you and I are. That emptying of himself. Could that be the example that he set? Are we supposed to empty ourselves? What does that look like? Jesus' call for believers to wash dirty feet implies that there is nothing beneath us. If there is a need and we can assist, there is nothing beneath us. Nothing. He purposely chose the lowest of the low. Now, I can think of things that were lower, but according to what I've read, this was low to have to wash people's feet. And that's pretty low. Hey, your job is to wash people's feet. He purposely chose that one to say to you and me, you are not so special that you can't stoop to do the lowest, most menial task when when the need is there for it to be done, to serve your brother and your sister, or even your enemy, like he served Judas. Is there anything beneath you? I couldn't do that. It's beneath me. You see, foot washing for Jesus was more than an act of self-humiliation. It was an act of forgiveness. Jesus knew what his hapless disciples would do when he was arrested. They were weak and they were frightened. They are just men. Like I said earlier, they'll betray him, they'll deny him, they'll all desert him and run away. But he still washed their feet knowing that that's what they were about to do. Jesus died not simply so disciples would not have to, but to encourage them to also be self-giving. Verse 17 says this, Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. I'm going to just read that two more times for those of you that were starting to fall asleep. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Knowing without doing is not where we want to be. You want to be blessed. You want to have a life of contentment and peace. You want that thing off your back that you're, you think you need it so badly and you're pulling it up the hill. And Jesus said, boy, would you like to set your burden down? Would you like to get rid of that? You don't need that. Let me show you a better way. A better way through service instead of pride. Clinging and climbing and doing what you can to be somebody. So he says, now that you know these things, I hope I've done a good job. Maybe we get a glimpse of what these things are. The heart of a servant who loves with humility is what Jesus calls us to. We are blessed if we do them. 
You can't just sit there in that seat this morning and hear it. You've got to ask yourself, to what extent is my life the life of a servant? I want to be like Christ. You know, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, my brother and sister, would you get rid of that silly nonsense of pride in your life? You will never be greater than God. Never. Trade in your pride. It leaves you worn out. Trade it in for the humility of service and find yourself living the abundant life that God promises us. Get rid of that silly nonsense. Open your eyes to the load on your back and drop it. Think about the paradox of humble service being the thing that actually brings relief and contentment. It doesn't make sense. If I'm the slave, if I'm the servant, if I'm the one that's looking out for the needs of others and nothing's too menial for me to do, boy, that sounds terrible. That sounds like work. That sounds like ooh, misery. It's a paradox, isn't it? That's the way Scripture is. Because the way our sin nature sees things is the exact opposite as the way they really are. It is in the service of God. It is in being His slave, being owned by Him, that we come to the place of peace and rest and contentment. And it is the place of pride where we have to do it all and become something and be somebody and look better than the next guy where we are find ourselves miserable doing really stupid things.